What's up everyone, it's Dakota and welcome back to another Magic the Gathering video. August 26th, 2024 has the potential to be one of the biggest banned and restricted announcements of all time. In terms of its impact on multiple formats, it has the potential to make some pretty big changes that could bust the field wide open for some new strategies to pop up or maybe some older strategies that were kind of held back due to what was kind of going on in the format to kind of take center stage again and slowly you know, increase its hold on the format and uh, potentially get some pretty healthy. I mean, granted, with what is actually getting banned in this announcement, uh, the formats are already like healthier. Uh, we'll just have to see uh, if anything kind of becomes toxic in the formats again. But of course, before we get too deep into the ban and restricted article and we kind of go over exactly their reasoning for what cards they banned, if you're not already subscribed to the channel and you want to see more videos from me where we post a lot pertaining to the Pioneer and Modern format, as well as some other longer form videos. Uh, so if any of that interests you, please consider subscribing, ring the notification bell, so you know when those videos get posted. We are so close to 1,000 subscribers. That was our goal for the year, and uh, we're on pace to hit that before we even go to Regional Championship uh, DC here in October, and I would kind of like to hit that goal before then, uh, just because I think it'd be kind of cool to uh you know you know like the the guy standing in the corner like in the memes like they don't know that i have a thousand subscribers on youtube well everyone's having fun and i eventually go like oh two oh three drop in the regional championship so uh yeah you know if if you want to support the channel everything like that it's a free easy way to do so and i would greatly appreciate it now with all that self-deprecating out of the way let's go ahead and look at the august 26 2024 bnr let's kind of react to what is going on here give some thoughts and of course look at their thoughts and uh, look at an interesting article that had to be, you know, given for another card all entirely in this list. So let's go ahead and check it out. So the big reveal of Magic's most impactful BNR announcement. Pioneer, Amelia Benavides Aguirre, banned. Soren Imperious Bloodlord, banned. Modern, Nadu, Wing Wisdom. This card was already halfway to the fucking sun when <laughs> when we knew that this card was printed. Like, it was already there. Banned. Finally, officially done. One of Modern's most uh, egregious formats. Finally, uh, at least gets changed by one of the cards that were probably one of the worst designed Magic cards of all time. Uh, and then Grief uh, getting banned as well, which uh, really wasn't on our radar just because I think of all the trauma that we've had from getting scammed for so long that I was just kind of like okay with it. Like the different flavors of getting scammed, it either gets ephemerated or it gets not dead after all. Or, you know, in the case of Legacy, where we also see Grief banned, uh, they just reanimate it and, uh, you know, they lose for life. It's probably arguably the the worst of all of them, but, you know, still sucks in a format like Legacy. Uh, vintage, we see Urza Saga getting restricted, and Vexing Bauble also getting restricted, which Vexing Bauble, uh, like, basically counters a spell if uh, there was no mana spent to cast it in, in a format like Vintage, where you have the Moxes, Black Lotus, things like that. Uh, you can cast things very easily for free. But, you know, like, whatever about Vintage, like, I'm never going to be able to afford to play this format. Um, but, you know, the ones that we care about, Pioneer, Modern, we see uh, Amalia getting the hammer, Soren getting the hammer, Nadu and Grief in Modern getting it. So let's go ahead, let's scroll down and kind of see their reasoning for it. Um, oh, but I actually forgot about this. All right, so there's an, they're updating the BNR announcement cadence. So following along with me here, uh, today we're going to be starting off by addressing the issue that we have with the timing of our band restricted announcements. The current timing of the BNR announcements to set, uh, to set releases, placing the announcements on the Monday prior to the start of Duskmorn House of Horror previews. The goal in doing so was to make sure that each set had proper context for evaluating new cards and to provide fewer points where decks would change. However, this timing did not take into account the timing of our competitive play seasons, namely regional championships, RCs, regional championship qualifiers, RCQs, and the Pro Tour, which is pretty interesting now. I, I think that this change kind of comes hot off the heels of the, you know, uh, Magic Showcase series that they have uh, planned for 2025. And I think uh, if they're kind of gearing things more towards competitive play and they're bringing more things back, I think that it totally makes sense for them to make these changes uh, to their announcement uh, to pertain to like the regional championships, RCQs, and Pioneer, or the Pro Tours in mind. Just because, like, to me, that makes the most sense if you're going to, you know, kind of push more competitive play that you kind of detail the BNR to that. Because in reality, like, 
who cares? Like, as far as, like, a casual player, you know, like, yeah, if you play on Arena, you're just kind of, you know, at, at, at the mercy of them banning cards, like, standard, historic, whatever. But, like, if you just play, like, casual Magic, like, in paper, and, you know, you're just playing whatever you want to play, like, the fact that, you know, the bannings come a, a month or so out, you know, past, like, the release date, like, you don't really care about it. But, like, obviously the players that are trying to qualify for the, these major events or just play in tournaments that have a little bit higher stakes to them, uh, it makes sense to kind of line up those announcements with, you know, regional championship coming up, RCQs, and, like, the Pro Tour. You know, for, the for like, the 0.1% of us that get to play in the Pro Tour as well. So going on, uh, this led to BNR announcements that occur in the middle of competitive seasons, or just as we saw with this most recent announcement on June 24th, they can occur the week of the Pro Tour. This can make difficult for players to have confidence in their deck selection and the events that they plan for, both from a testing perspective and a logistical one, which is a very good you know, reason to at least look at changing it. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of stuff that goes into Pro Tour testing. I don't know if there's necessarily any videos. I know that you kind of get, like, an insight, but, like, a direct video of, like, you know, players from, like, a Team Channel Fireball. And uh, I'm not sure about the uh, the other one, like, Team Handshake, if there's any, like, kind of record of, like, what they do. But, like, Team Channel Fireball, usually, like, a week or two, Seems like they get like a house, they get all the players in it, and then they're just constantly drafting, playing different decks, and just, you know, going at it for hours and hours a day. And imagine putting in all that work. Again, that's like the the one percent like the top point one percent of the point one percent that get to go to the Pro Tour. You know, for someone like me, if I ended up getting to the Pro Tour, I don't even know if there's like there's probably like a group of people I could get to like play test with, but uh I certainly wouldn't be able to afford to like you know, take that group of people, like, get, like, a, a house or whatever somewhere, like, in the town that the tournament's going on, like, a, even a week or two before the event, and then just be able to play test and stuff like that. But, you know, that's just something that, uh, you know, especially for me, if it was, like, oh, there's, like, a banning, like, a week before, it's, like, oh, I already picked up this deck because I thought it was going to be one of the better bets to take to the Pro Tour, and now it's banned, and that kind of sucks. Uh, which they go on to explain here later. It's clear that the timing of the June 24th abandoned restricted announcement was poor, so much so that we notified the public ahead of time that we, we won't be making any changes to the modern so that players could appropriately plan for Pro Tour Modern Horizons 3. This was certainly not ideal. Moving forward, they'll be aligning the BNR announcements to the RC and RCQ seasons. This will allow us to make adjustments to our play environments to ensure the best experience possible for our competitive play pipeline. Our plan is to use the RC and RCQ seasons, which includes Pro Tours, to gather data and observe the evolution of how each format absorbs each new release. This also means fewer BNR announcements overall. To that end, our next BNR announcement will be on December 16th, 2024. It is worth noting that we don't plan on changing the current standard BNR philosophy, meaning we still only want a one year one one window per year barring an emergency where we consider taking action standard and i actually really like this uh I, I guess like this new cadence that they're calling it for the BNR announcement. Uh, again as i said kind of like at the top of the article if your idea is to inject more uh pro play or just more competitive play into the into magic as a whole AKA like kind of bringing back some of the stuff that we lost due to, you know, COVID and things like that, where we're going to have these like GP style events. We're going to have, you know, these RCQs that flood into RCs, the in North America, especially getting more region, you know, an extra regional championship, which is going to be handing out more world slots, the same amount of PT slots, but more world slots. Uh, I think that you can kind of, you know, uh, gear your ban and restricted announcements, which I think kind of, you know, go more hand in hand with the competitive players to kind of, you know, line up better with the competitive season or what season we're going to be going to. So I think this is a great change overall for, especially for like the competitive players, uh, the philosophy not changing for standard, like really standard shouldn't have any like ban like there should just be probably emergency bannings in standard and then if there's something that's just annoying but nothing that's like really oppressive or whatever you know have like that one year window i think it's like in the fall or something like that uh, from like a previous article that uh you can take action there so overall i think i like that philosophy change uh going into it where instead of doing it maybe more often and after set releases where it could be kind of awkward just doing it during the uh 
competitive season where you kind of have like three, say like three to four different chances to kind of change what's going on, depending on if they count like the pro tour as like an event as well, you know, a part of that season, which it seems like they do. So we can see like three to four potential changes a year. And I think that works out better for people that are like preparing for, you know, an RCQ season for a specific format and not getting completely hosed. Although if you decide like if you decided to play like Nadu, knowing that it was going to get banned, like that that's basically like the the sentiment that I pointed out in all my videos. Like, do not play Nadu unless uh, do not completely buy into Nadu unless you have like most of the stuff. Then like go ahead and play because it's the best thing to be doing. Uh, so standard, we know no changes. Uh, we experienced our first rotation in a new three-year standard format world, and things look exciting. Many of the goals that our new standard plan is being achieved. We wanted players to be able to play their decks and cards longer, and we want new sets to add content to existing decks while also creating some new strategies. The fact that we only considered standard bannings once a year has given folks higher confidence in their collections that are safe and uh, get the most out of their cards. The release of Bloomborough along with the rotation of the four oldest sets have given rise to new strategies, while adding a smattering of cards to existing archetypes. The macro archetypes of mid-range, aggro, and control have all all have ample representation among winning strategies. While we can't touch on everything that's been going on in Standard these days, we want to point out just a couple examples of things we like seeing from our first rotation news. Uh, the previous year, domain strategies, which took advantage of the streets of New Capenna type trilands, Jamir's Garden of Friends, has survived the loss of those lands, replacing them with Bloomborough's Fabled Passage, with uh, and murders of Carla Banner's surveillance, while also replacing Topiary Stomper with Heaped Harvest. Players still get to play most of their domain decks with uh, while making a few updates. On this, on another axis, we see folks trying to uh, trying out decks like Rakdos Lizards as a brand new. Typal strategy comprised mostly of new cards from Bloomborough. This previously undersupported creature type saw an influx of new members, including Gev, uh, Scaled Scorch, uh, Iridescent Vine Lasher. The deck uh, packs quite the punch with synergy between lizards, puts pressure on the opponent, backed up by consistency of untapped lands across multiple formats, specifically utilizing Cavern of Souls and naming uh, lizards. While synergy is in a great place, many of the other formats have been struggling, and we're going to be highlighted in the clearest issue. Uh, highlighting the clearest issues with each and taking more action today is a single BNR announcement in quite some time. So now let's look at Pioneer. Uh, Amalia Benavides Aguirre has been banned, and so is Sword Imperius Bloodlord. Uh, in kind of like my prediction video, I actually thought it would be the inverse, where I would want to see, I mean, Soren or Vein Ripper. I could have taken either one. I kind of wanted Soren to stick around just to be kind of like a cool, like, vampire kind of payoff, even if it is just like a one-sided, like, show-and-tell. Really wasn't much of anything. It really didn't have much of an impact until Vein Ripper was, you know, printed into the format. Amalia was another card that I thought had like an interesting design space, and I would have liked to have seen Amalia be the one to kind of stick around over something like Wild Growth Walker, where, you know, who cares about Wild Growth Walker? You know, people weren't playing Explore Strategies anyway, and I thought Amalia was at least kind of an interesting one. So, uh, kind of unfortunate to see them both go, as I, you know, we predicted that these, that these decks would see bannings, and uh, they were the opposite ones that we were kind of, at least that I was kind of hoping for. So... Their explanation, over the past several months, we've been able to gather data and observe results from a full season of Pioneer Regional Championship qualifiers, as well as data from other tabletop events and various Magic Online leagues and challenges. The format has two clear outliers that we will be addressing today, Vampires and Amalia. Since Seth Manfield's Pro Tour win back in February, which feels like forever ago at this point, to be honest with you, I mean, that's like six months ago, like six and a half months ago at the most. Uh, at least as this video is going up. Uh, Ragdoll's Vampires has been a growing force in the Pioneer metagame. We've gradually seen the deck's metagame share grow over time, approaching levels we deem pro we believe to be problematic. The deck's marquee play of turn 3 Soren, Imperius, Bloodlord, and Vein Ripper is so potent, the main decks struggle to interact with it at all. Traditional removal needs to be backed up with a sacrificial creature for you to even target it, and in doing so, you're still facing Soren, have lost two cards, have some have lost some life while they've gained some life. It is an exchange that is difficult to come back from, um, and not only that's not only if your answers and battlefield present has already been picked apart by the deck's efficient thoughtsies slash fatal push one two combo, which is uh, a very true because uh, it's you know like the, you have like this one turn window to interact with like Vein Ripper 
in any sort of meaningful way because after that they just can it can continue to tear apart your hand like absolutely insane uh with such a large metagame share above 30 percent over the rcq season it is clear the deck's existence is shrinking the diversity of the metagame with the degree we deem unhealthy while it is fairly likely that rakdos vampires players will be able to transition back into playing more traditional rakdos midrange decks we believe the removal of the turn three pressure event should open up the metagame a bit giving other strategies some breathing room while Soren Imperius Bloodlords existed in Pioneer for quite a few years without causing any problems, we've seen how the release of a single powerful top end vampire has brought it right up to the front of the metagame. When considering which part of the two card combo to act on, one consideration is how likely one of the two cards is to cause an issue with the other one in the environment with other cards in the environment with the potential future cards that may exist one day. Playing a card's printed mana cost is generally safe and fair strategy while being able to discount a card by several mana is sometimes too strong for this reason Sorian imperious blood lord is banned in pioneer which makes total sense you know the reasoning i think that uh you know i think vein ripper in general playing vein ripper on like turn six you know me and me and randy have talked about my co-host on the casual spikes podcast you know we've talked about you know vein ripper on turn six is totally fine where uh soren into vein ripper is you know it's too early for some decks to be able to you know interact with it favorably and uh overall I think that uh, I don't think they could have went wrong banning either. You know, Vein Ripper seems like kind of the crazier one to leave like Soren around. But I think that at least if you uh, if you kind of remember that Soren is like this thing that is legal uh, that you could print like a vampire. Like it, I think uh, Vein Ripper is like okay ish if you just get rid of the ward on it. But then of course like there's probably no one playing Vein Ripper, so you know just kind of have to take the good with the bad but i think overall like this banning is probably pretty safe just leaving uh vein ripper in the format over uh soren imperious bloodlord even though i think the design space you know like the potential for like soren to kind of help energize like a vampire strategy that may be a little bit more low to the ground maybe uh something we'd seen like in standard back in the day where you know it's a, a generally kind of an aggro deck and then you know you had like champion of dusk be like the thing that enters so you can kind of fuel back up with a with a sore and while it's plussing to kind of uh help you in racing situations uh, as we've stated in the previous bnr announcement the amalia deck is the one we've had our eyes on for a while a creature-based combo deck combo decks are something we believe adds positive texture to a format's metagame when reasonable unfortunately this particular version of a creature combo deck has too many problems like being able to wipe the board on turn three and then also have a lethal attacker uh, the decks use Amalia, Benavides Aguirre, Wild Growth Walker, and various ways to gain life to kick off a series of triggers that normally ends with a 20 power Amalia, a slew of cards being drawn or milled, a large amount of life being gained, and all their creatures being destroyed. And if that wasn't enough, players have found a way to give Wild Growth Walker indestructible, causing the game to result in a draw as Amalia triggers an infinite number of times. This is not ideal as a gameplay experience and certainly was not something our team caught during playtesting the Lost Caverns of Ixalan. In addition a, to a handful of situations where the deck causes the game to end in a draw, the full package is quite resilient. Being able to recur various pieces of the combo with cards like Return to the Ranks and Extraction Specialist, while also drawing them directly from the library with Court of Calling and Collected Company, gives the deck a degree of consistency and power that has made it one of the most successful decks in the format. With the combination of power, consistency, and the ability to draw games have led us to ban Amalia Benavides Aguirre in the Pioneer format. We've considered other cards as well. Treasure Cruise and Fable the Mirror Breaker, which were cards that we brought up uh, in our video, uh, were discussed at length. Our team decided that uh, while each of the following formats clearly needs a change, we wanted to take an approach that would allow us to make the most important changes necessary for each format without possibly going too far. This will be a common sentiment as you read more about the changes to other formats. We're confident in each of these changes uh, for these formats that makes them more fun, but how much more fun? We'd like to observe uh, this set of changes and see how each format evolves and decide if changes are necessary in the next BNR on December 16th. So overall, with Amalia and uh, Soren being banned, I think that was a you know pretty good call. I think those were essentially a given, like some combination of the four cards from those decks, whether it's going to be you know Soren or Vein Ripper, is it going to be Amalia or Wild Growth Walker? There really wasn't a question of you know is the deck going to get hit or not. It was it was going to be you know which combination of these four cards are going to be hit or rather i guess two one of two cards from each deck and then how deep were we going to cut from there uh we talked about treasure cruise fable the mirror breaker just being some very good decks i think with fable the mirror breaker still being legal 
that players are still going to, are going to gravitate towards Rakdos midrange instead of just playing Rakdos vampires, which, you know, isn't necessarily surprising because Rakdos midrange going into that pro tour really wasn't like a bad pick. I think it was the second most played deck. I think it might've been the most played deck in the format going into there, either that or Phoenix, either way, it was like in the top three, uh, most registered decks in that tournament. Now, whether vampires got included in that Rakdos midrange, I don't know. For uh, un with un with certainty, I'm not sure. But uh, either way, like the second or third most played deck in that format, and uh, Treasure Cruise still being legal, Fable and Mirror still being legal. You know, like Phoenix is still going to be a deck that is pretty popular. I think players are going to gravitate more towards with some other interesting changes kind of being made to those decks to kind of, you know, uh, kind of inject some new blood into the deck. Uh, we have like mono green is going to get better. More people are probably going to play the, uh, like five color, like niv Mizzet decks and things like that. It's going to be pretty cool to see what, what happens in pioneer going forward. And we're going to be doing like prediction videos for pioneer and modern throughout the week before we get into, you know, the first set of modern, like RCQs and like challenges, uh, just cause that's the current competitive season. And of course, players playing in a new pioneer format as well. We'll kind of see early on what is catching on and doing well, but, uh, overall, like I'm pretty happy with the changes in pioneer uh i would have obviously liked to have seen the inverse of those picks but uh hearing the explanation reading the explanations and things like that i can kind of understand why uh i don't think amalia is all that great if you just get rid of the way to you know ban it going infinite quote unquote uh till it can end up blowing up the board but uh i guess to kind of you know again uh increase like future design things for you know maybe explore decks then you know that's probably fine and of course like soren again like you can get some pretty powerful vampires uh at a pretty good cost but like why not just print them cheaper that's that's a joke that's as much sarcasm like as i can inject into that uh but overall you know i'm fine with the changes in pioneer uh we'll definitely probably see some deeper cuts coming in the december 16th list so uh with that said let's go ahead and track over to modern and see what their what they uh their reasoning for the cards that were banned so now we move on to modern and arguably a probably more expected banning in uh, Nadu Winged Wisdom, probably one of the, I don't know, probably one of the best strategies of all time in modern, and really just, uh, you know, legendary and what it's caused. Uh, I believe just this past weekend at the uh, NRG event in the top eight, Brian Bronduin, a, uh, I'm, I'm going to call him a pro player. I don't know if he really plays Magic, like, all that much anymore. You know, we really don't hear him like being at the pro tour or anything like that but you know a former world champion took like a 30 plus minute turn in the top eight of an nrg series on camera <laughs> going through all the nadu stuff and like the fact that there was no like slow play warning issue or anything like that is pretty crazy i just basically skimmed through that because i'm not sitting and watching 30 plus minutes of a nadu player essentially win the game and the opponent refusing to concede that point but you get the picture nadu winged wisdom actually has its own article within the bnr so it doesn't actually go over nadu uh in this uh article it has a whole other article dedicated to it just to tell you like how bad you know this card was for modern but the other surprising one is a four mana spell that uh I thought could potentially have been the ring, but it's actually grief. Maybe a year too late, but grief does end up here now um, being, you know, a card that honestly at this point, it's like uh, trauma almost where, you know, you just get grief scammed so many times that it's just normal where, you know, it just, it's a thing that happens. It's a feature of the modern format now, but now grief is banned. So we have now, you know, three of the five pitch elementals and, uh, or three of the five legal and it turns out the most busted ones were the ones that didn't have flash. So that tells you anything. Uh, so uh, we'll kind of go through this part real quick. Uh, as mentioned in the opening section of the article, the timing of the previous BNR announcement was poor. We believe that it is important for players to know when to expect changes for formats, changes to formats. As we thought it was important to stay committed to the announcement dates as promised. The date leading up to the week of the Modern Pro Tour in Instagram was simply too early and would have served us all better being a few weeks after the event instead. This caused the last month and a half of Modern to be fairly stagnant. Players knew uh, they were likely to ban Nadu on the next opportunity, but they also knew that it was the best chance to win the event was likely playing Nadu. 
It was a poor experience for players, stores, and tournament organizers. With the changes to the cadence of the BNR announcements, we would likely targeted we would have likely targeted the end of july before folks were started engaging in the current modern rcq season while we can't go back in time and remedy that we can learn from past and change our approach to the future and we certainly take this time now to address the clear issues with the format michael majors the lead designer for modern horizons 3 and resident modern format expert a great player by the way very entertaining as well uh when he was with star city games uh had written a few words about the origin of how Nadu became to be and why we're banning it today uh, for some time now, grief has been um, maligned as one of the uh, least fun parts of competitive modern formats. So starting the game down two or three cards in, in various one mana ways can be returned, or can be returned, is quite brutal. Having to mulligan is already painful, but being double grief directly afterwards just exacerbates an already unfun experience. Even outside of mulligans, having a turn one answer to a three or four power menace creature after an opponent has taken away your best cards is just asking too much. While Grief is not currently seeing as much play as it has in the past, it is still a format staple used by several decks. Mono Black Necro Dominance, the Aspergorias Vengeance deck, Living End, Rakdos Midrange, and a handful of other decks still using one mana cards to abuse Grief's manaless evoke interaction. The interest in making the format more fun, we are banning Grief today. We certainly considered a few other cards to take action against in this announcement, mainly the One Ring, which is actually really cool. They use the One of One One Ring for that. Um, that's pretty sweet. While present in several decks, there's no clear one-ring deck terrorizing modern. Being a unique combination of self-protection and card advantage, it is a strong card that helps prop up several varied strategies. Ultimately, we decided not to act against the one-ring. The possible problems it may be causing for modern just aren't clear as just aren't as clear as Nadu and Grief. Once we see how the format evolves after this change, we will continue to observe and evaluate the health of modern and see if its future actions if necessary. On a more positive note, despite Nadu overshadowing much of the potential of what players can explore with the addition of Modern Horizons 3, we've seen a few non-Nadu strategy or non-Nadu cards and strategies find success. Energy and Eldrazi were uh, decks where themes we took intentional shots at propping up. Necrodominance is the namesake card of a brand new mono black strategy. Psychic Frog has transformed previous Is It Murktide decks into Demir versions. What else will be discovered in the Looming Shadows of Nadu is removed? Uh, as the Looming Shadows of Nadu is removed. Uh, so uh, overall, you know, uh, we'll go we'll go into the article real quick as like kind of an aside because uh, modern or legacy we kind of expected grief to be banned and rightfully so. Like this this card absolutely needed to go. Uh, all the scam like reanimator decks, scaminator, whatever, like super powerful, really really good. And that was like another deck where you know if you were playing modern you might as well just play Nadu because it's like absolutely the best thing to do. And you just learn some of the loops and things like that. And hope that your opponents too uh, can concede the game at a at a relative like quick pace. Uh, uh, but you know, same thing. Like if you want to win in Legacy, you just play like Scaminator, and thank God it's gone. You know, uh, could Psychic Frog have been banned? Maybe, but like we'll see kind of as they go forward. But uh, we'll get into this art- article about Nadu. But as far as just the bans in general in modern. Uh, I think for like the same thing with Pioneer, where I was kind of hoping they would have gone a little bit deeper. Modern, maybe you could have gone a little bit deeper. Kind of funny to ban Grief now when like a year ago, I think is when people were really like hard up on banning Grief because, you know, whether uh, Rakdos Midrange statistically was like a very good deck or not, it was just an unfun play experience playing against that deck where you get like Grief scammed on turn one into like turn two Dothy Voidwalker. Uh, into turn three, like Fable of the Mirror Breakers, just so much value, especially when you're on five cards minimum on the draw. And even being on the play, uh, there's like slightly more ways of interacting with it, but with like the ways that you could actually interact with Grief and how they ended up bringing it back just didn't really line up all that well. Especially, you know, you, you would have to sit on like two removal spells to be able to do it. And uh, even then, like it was just it was brutal. It was brutal because even if, then if you waited until they brought it back, you'd use the removal spell, and then, like, they would still have another trigger, and they just get rid of another card. So, like, Grief just created some pretty uh, miserable gameplay pattern. So, uh, while I think it's late, maybe well-deserved for the most part, the One Ring seeing a lot of play in uh, a lot of the top decks in the format, and I think just a, a card that, you know, creates some pretty bad 
play patterns, you know, where you just like play the one ring, your opponent draws like six cards off of it, or in the case of like, you know, Just Guy Control or some of the other decks where they get to play Manamo and they get to untap it and draw multiple cards, uh, playing Shielded and you get to gain a bunch of life on top of drawing cards to where like you mitigate essentially the life loss from the ring. And you're pretty incentivized at that point to, you know, if you have drawn other copies of the ring, play it, but then like let the old ring stick around because then you usually get to draw so many more cards and then get to uh, gain a bunch of life. It just, you know, overall, I think the one ring is a relatively like the play patterns it creates is like a problematic card which is why like we've had a few discussions on you know should we just restrict it because like one copy of it's fine and having to build around like trying to reset it yourself and everything like that and having to use other resources to kind of reset it other than additional copies is you know kind of here you know neither here nor there one thing or the other uh, but we're kind of playing as we lie now where the one ring is going to be one of the best things that you could be doing in the format, I believe, going forward. Uh, Nadu, you know, finally see it get out of here, quit ruining our format. Grief, probably a year too late, but not a bad banning as well. Uh, just from like potential play patterns and it looks like the ring uh, potentially in a December announcement could get the axe as well. So that's kind of like the state of modern. Let's go ahead. We'll check out this article written by Michael Majors about Nadu and just kind of skim over it like really quickly to kind of get a good understanding of, you know, what what happened with this card. So here we have the article written by Michael Majors on banning Nadu winged wisdom in modern. So it starts off as the lead designer of Modern Horizons 3. I wanted to weigh in on our decision today. Nadu Winged Wisdom was a design mistake. The community quickly identified in previous season that the combination of Shuko or Outrider on core with Nadu allowed a player to draw their entire library. As one would expect, many, er, many early lists were untuned, uh, being either too fragile or using Nadu more as an afterthought rather than the primary game plan. Before Pro Tour MH3, Nadu was clearly a strong deck, but hadn't quite shown itself as bannable, which I think is totally understandable in part. Uh, for the fact that obviously a lot of players, I mean, players are finally like getting their hands on it. Like this isn't theoretical testing anymore. This is actual testing of cards. And then it feels like the deck kind of just built itself from there. Uh, as we know, the Pro Tour changed. The Pro Tour changed that. The best players in the world had the incentive to tune the deck for the highest possible upside, and they delivered. They removed Thassa's Oracle from the deck and figured out how to handle any situation through a convoluted Endurance plus Spring Harden into Go Loop that could effectively give Nadu players infinite mana and means that you can fight through any situation, including interaction and battlefield sweepers. This loop also required demonstrating a complicated series of game actions with a high number of permanents changing zones that resulted in extremely long turns. Uh, look at the Apex Gaming event where uh, I believe it was like Don Delosier played like a 20 minute turn or whatever in like after time is called in the round we were in turns uh bbd taking like a 30 plus minute turn i think it was like someone said it was like a 40 plus minute turn but i think it was like on the high end of like 30 minutes which is still absolutely insane that you take almost an entire round to you know play essentially one game or the length that it would take to play one round of magic uh in one turn which is like again absolutely insane uh, the deck also not being deterministic either kind of gave players an incentive to keep playing, even though, you know, at some point when you have like two Nantukos going that you just end up winning the game. Also, the loop that they're talking about is that with uh, Springheart and Nantuko on an Endurance, you can, you know, essentially make uh, a bunch of mana and then uh, on the last landfall, you can have uh, make a copy of Endurance with the mana and then you like target yourself with it and then you shuffle, you know, you uh, use the uh, other creature uh, whatever it is to sacrifice all your lands, put them into your graveyard, and then they go back into your deck, and then uh, you're able to kind of keep the chain going uh, by having more things to target. So, uh, yeah, a, a nightmare, and it was absolutely awful. The deck was beautifully built in a logistical nightmare. The deck dominated the tournament with a 59% win rate, and Simon Nielsen claimed the Pro Tour trophy. Since then, it has performed worse. Some of the car uh, some of that can be attributed to the fact the deck is objectively weaker in online formats, which we've talked about at length on many videos. Many players still resort to using Thassa's Oracle, a weak card outside of the combo, and once they've drawn their entire deck due to the endurance loop, being unrealistic under an online timer. This makes the deck more vulnerable to mulligans and weaker to interaction. Despite that, it continues to be a prevalent part of the winner's metagame and online and is threatening to put up incredible numbers at rcqs removing another combination of cards like shuko or outright iron core wouldn't solve the logistical problem that nadu presents even at weaker win rates nadu leveraging lightning greaves or similar cards could be problematic for a long-term enjoyment of tournaments since it threatens to monopolize people's time all the while not being a fun or easy deck to interact with isn't a compelling argument to preserve the deck 
For these reasons, Nadu Winged Wisdom is banned. See, isn't that crazy that there's just other ways that you, you know, we could ban like 15 cards to like make Nadu a thing to like stick around, or we could just ban Nadu and then still have all these cards legal that probably aren't going to do anything, but, you know, still, you know, they're still legal in the format, you know? Uh, Nadu is like an absolutely insane magic card and anybody defending that this card should be should stay stick around whatever your reason is uh, and if you're in the camp of like we should just ban 20 cards so the Nadu isn't a playable card well then you're just absolutely insane because that is just like not that's not the point like that's it, it, no. No, that is an awful reason. Uh, not understanding data. Obviously, they didn't use a lot of data here. Uh, there was just a lot of like unspecific, you know, terms like taking extremely long turns. We've seen many of turns like on camera at various different levels of play that you know Nadu would take you know double digit minutes. Even like taking a 10, 15 minute turn, like in your four player game of commander, that's fine. I guess, you know, I, you know, people can kind of put up with it because everyone else is probably going to take, you know, get rid of, you know, do their thing in a reasonable amount of time. But this deck in a 60 card constructed format, taking 20, 30, 40 minutes to execute its thing. And then it just also can't play an instant win condition like Thassa's Oracle. It has to do like a million and one different things to uh, be able to do it. And then even online, it's like weaker, but people still put up results with it. it is absolutely nuts. This deck was probably one of the most busted uh, modern decks of all time, period, full stop. Go talk to a wall. I don't care. Like the fact that Nadu is finally gone is awesome because we basically knew that it was going to be leaving and you know finally uh it is gone and they're now like changing the whole band structure so that something like this uh, at least a banning in the middle of the regional championship qualifier season does not take place because as we know that pioneer didn't have any changes mainly because they didn't uh, feel like anything was like that problematic where it needed an emergency ban in the middle of the qualifying season so that players weren't like out of a deck basically so with that said how did we get here uh, Nadu went through almost all of Modern Horizons 3's development looking something like this. So Nadu Winged Wisdom being one green and a blue for a legendary creature, Bird Wizard 3-4 Flyer. You may cast permanent spells as though they had flash, and whenever a permanent you control becomes the target of a spell or ability an opponent controls, reveal the top card of your library. If it's a land card, put it on the battlefield, otherwise put it to your hand. Nadu was a powerful option against interaction and a part of various Bant mid-range strategies throughout our testing, but it wasn't something that our group perceived as much more than a role player. For some context, Modern Horizons testing works differently than typical standard FFL, Future, uh, Future, Future League. Uh, both Modern Horizons 2 and Modern Horizons 3, we brought in a small group of contractors and worked the set in a dedicated sprint as a collaboration between that group and a small number of player designers. The playtesting time is more dense, and the group is singularly focused on a set without any other responsibilities, but shorter in terms of weeks. After the playtesting, there was a series of last-minute checks uh, of the set by various groups. This is the normal operating procedure for every release. It is a series of opportunities for folks from various departments and disciplines to weigh in on every component of the project and give a final feedback. In one of the meetings, there was a great deal of concern raised by Nadu's flash-granting ability for commander play. After removing the ability, it wasn't clear that the card would have an audience or a home and instead is important for every card that we make. Something that is important for every card that we make. Ultimately, my intention was to uh, create a build around aimed at commander play, which resulted in the final text of, you know, this triggers twice each turn, and it's like anything can target it. Um, I miss the zero interaction, zero mana abilities that are so, interaction with zero mana abilities that are so problematic. The last round of folks who were shown the card in the building missed it too. We didn't play test with Nadu's final iteration as we were too far along in the process and it shipped as is. I want to go over some talking points and learnings before, but before I do, I'll emphasize that despite the failings and process, ultimately the card was my responsibility as the lead designer of the set. So Michael Major is essentially just taking like accountability, of course, kind of also saying like, hey, there's other people in the process too, but as the lead designer like that, it's on me. So I'm, I'm kind of cool with, you know, the slight, the slight deflection, I would say just in terms of just the fact that he named a, you know, unspecified group of people, but ultimately taking the responsibility. And I think that's, that's a great like leadership quality, especially being the leader of MH3. So I guess to kind of finish up like that point before, uh, <laughs> before I got ran in on, um, so the fact that like Modern Horizons 3 and a lot of the Modern Horizon sets have been very, 
you know, impactful and modern to say the least, like at, at the minimum, they've been like some of the most impactful sets that we've had. And the fact that, you know, Michael Majors is like saying, Hey, like I, I screwed up like this. It is what it is. Like where, you know, I'm going to learn from this. I'm going to be a better designer is a, a great accountability from, from the lead designer. And I, I really do applaud, uh, I do applaud that in somebody because it's hard to kind of take ownership, especially when I'm sure a lot of players are just blindly like blaming play design and everything like that. And, you know, his team essentially taking a lot of heat for Nadu and uh, just wanting and just wanting to create a game piece that would be fun for commander players or just fun for players in general and for somebody out there. So can't really blame him for that because at, at heart, you know, we all we all want something from from something. So, um Going on, uh, the scope of the risk, a lot of the early buzz surrounding Nadu included comments like, why does it have four toughness? Or if it only triggered once, it would be okay. Uh, and the most extreme being, did they put the quotations on the card in the wrong place? As I've already gone over, the most obvious answer to things is typically the right one. Nadu is not an attempt to push the card to the perceived maximum power level and missing the mark. If I had grasped the scope of risk here, I would have changed the text box entirely and not hope that trimming a toughness would land us in the perfect spot. However, um, uh, huh. however, much of managing Modern Horizon sets is walking the tightrope of risk. Ugin's Labyrinth and Chthonian Nightmare are examples of cards that we shipped with eyes wide open. There was a chance of those cards going wrong, but uh, they are things we deemed worth doing to inject power and excitement into both lapsed and brand new decks. As a concrete example of something we changed, Amp Raptor had more of a cascade-like ability early in development. This resulted in a lot of Glimpse of Tomorrow being cast. So this is like a same card where you shuffle all your permanents into your library, and then you reveal that many cards, and uh, you put all non-aura permanent cards revealed this way onto the battlefield, and you do the same for auras, and then you, so which means that you can attach some two things, and you put the rest on the bottom in a random order. Uh, the deck wasn't too strong, but the combo turns took forever, and the deck wasn't very enjoyable. We even failed to patch it out a few times by changing Amp Raptor in various ways, but ultimately we have a redesign of the card uh, to what it is now to avoid as many shenanigans as possible. The benefits of creating this new Glimpse deck didn't make up for how unenjoyable the play pattern was. Many more cards in Modern Horizons 3 are open-ended build-arounds that try not to be immediately obvious how to use them. We put them through their paces as a group and in most cases didn't conclude how to optimize them. To me, magic is the most fun when it presents a puzzle for uh, people to experiment and debate with, or to experiment with and debate. In quotations, so, right, you missed it, and clearly there's a desire to take risks, so what does that mean moving forward? So, what we learn, and both this is both a design and logistical failure, this is something we are trying to tackle in a variety of ways. The ban and restricted announcement timing is changing to be optimized for RCQs and widespread competitive play going forward. While we can't guarantee we'll avoid bans in the future, we can take steps to make sure they will do as little damage as possible for players who want to invest their time and energy into competitive formats. On the inside, it's a combination of things. One, at a high level, we want to make sure that, that all relevant groups have time to impact change in a time window that makes sense for the project. I have faith that if the current Nadu had been scrutinized while our contractors were actively playtesting, things would have turned out better. Two, I'll be putting more effort towards being conservative if I can't draw clear conclusions as well as encouraging that behavior in others. I don't know that... I didn't know that Shuko was powerful with Nadu. However, I was aware that I didn't fully understand the implications of Nadu's text box. That should have urged me to be more aggressively seek other options or seek other opinions and failing any strong conclusions to default to something I better understood. I was blinded by a goal. Make something that is really awesome for somebody. Ultimately, nobody was happy. I'll conclude by stressing the point that magic is a game of enormous complexity. We won't get things right all the time or always be able to predict uh, how the formats respond. However, the creation of this game is a labor of love, and so in these situations that fall on the side of clear mistakes and clear so with clear solutions, we take them very seriously, always looking to improve the way we make the game. And I, again, I think this whole article, like top to bottom, without necessarily going into like the specifics of like actual play, of Nadu again there's like at least a few examples of players like playing the deck and taking way too long on their turn like maybe in terms of how the deck combos maybe they're not taking a lot of time but like in the grand scheme of things you know if you take like a 20 30 minute turn in any format you know I don't I don't care what it is like especially in a deck that doesn't technically win the game that turn other than like in a few cases where they're playing like the uh uh the hour devastation whatever, like the Finale of Devastation and then the uh, uh, Thassa's Oracle, which, you know, 
I would, I would say, I guess is sort of kind of guaranteed at that point, but also in the same, not really because those cards aren't optimal for the deck to kind of participate and function in a way. But uh, overall, you know, I'm kind of happy that Michael Majors essentially took this on his shoulders and, you know, we took this as like a growing experience. Uh, I think that with the combination of how they did BNR and uh, wanting to kind of stick to that schedule, ultimately had Nadu stick around a lot longer than it should have. And I think that there was like kind of a point where like, eh, maybe this will kind of like correct itself and turns out it, it really didn't because um, even I think that if there was no hinting that Nadu was going to be banned or you know even like in this bnr i think that we would have seen a lot more nadu than we did now uh, the fact that it's worse online it's you know still pretty good in paper but obviously everyone has like the guns pointed at its head it was still one of the most played decks uh it was a deck that wasn't necessarily deterministic up until a certain point so you just had to have your opponent play it out and you know you as the person playing it hope that you didn't screw up but uh, in general, just uh, a, a miserable play experience. And, you know, uh, I'm glad to see that it, it is finally gone. Uh, it basically gets to move up into the tier of, you know, how broken was this deck? And, you know, is it one of the best decks of all time? And, uh, you know, that's a decision for, you know, most people to kind of, you know, draw their own conclusions to. Maybe we've, we kind of drew our own in, in a separate video before. But yeah, like overall, you know, this ban and restricted announcement, very impactful for all three formats in, in Modern, in Legacy, and in Pioneer. Pioneer lost its two best decks, uh, Amalia just straight up being ripped away from the format. Uh, Rakdos Vampires, gone. We're going to probably see more traditional Rakdos decks uh, with the potential of something like Fable the Mirror Breaker or the uh, Treasure Cruise being banned. And of course, Modern. Nadu, the bird wizard that destroyed a format, is no more. You know, people aren't having to worry about dying on like turn three to a combo that, uh, in the worst case, is going to draw the, draw their opponent like six, eight, ten cards uh, and possibly be able to do it on their turn depending on how they combo. Uh, or, you know, people getting scammed on turn on turn one, uh, especially with, you know, things like Gorio's Vengeance, where you're going to be able to use that kind of effect to great effect and, uh, and a few edge cases as well on top of, you know, just getting scammed in various different ways. So pretty cool. We have some things that we can look out for, uh, be on the lookout for videos later this week that are going to be kind of addressing like specific things in the modern and pioneer format, as we always do with any ban and restricted announcement and kind of make some predictions of what the format will look like in the short term and in the long term. Of course, while we can't necessarily predict, uh, like what cards are going to be printed and who's going to get what upgrades and things like that, but we can look at what we have available to us now decks that end up getting better and you know things that maybe get worse now that those decks are not uh, legal in the format or they're having to significantly change how they play so that is going to do it for me that is the ban restricted announcement those are the reasonings behind the cards that are banned you know let me know what you think in the comments down below if uh this this was kind of a miss if there was uh you know, other cards that could have been banned, maybe, you know, if you think that they got it right. Personally, for me, I think that they got it right and they accomplished their goal of, like, you know, very precise bannings that are going to impact the format, but not, you know, banning five or six cards, even though I probably would have liked to have seen that in, you know, Modern and Pioneer and just kind of have a more of a hard reset on things, but... You know, I think this is um, ultimately like a safe option in trying to keep uh, as many cards or have the chance to have as many cards legal in those formats as possible. So thank you all for watching. Hope you all enjoyed the video. Leave a like if you enjoyed it. Dislike if you didn't. Leave a comment down below what you think of the banned and restricted announcement, if they should have went harder or if they should have uh, maybe even not have banned a card that they ended up banning. You know, of course, let me know what you think in the comments down below. Unless it's Nadu, because it's already going to piss me off if you talk about Nadu and saying it was an okay card. So that's going to be me in this video. Hope you all enjoyed it, and I hope to see you all in the next one.